Welcome to the ID10T Podcast number 1063. So a lot of fun stuff to get through uh, in the intro, so I'm just going to get right to it. This episode is Laura Linney, who is rad. I mean, look, not not to mention the fact that she's one of the best actors of our generation. Beyond that, she's so super cool and that's one of the reasons why I love doing these podcasts is finding out that people that I'm a fan of already, just based on their work alone, is, are also super cool human beings. We had such a great chat. And with a lot of these podcasts that are done via video conferencing, something that I never envisioned was, oh, when I talk to people, I'll kind of get to see what their space is like. Like, you know, just wor- wherever they are in their home, just a glimpse of what their space is like. And we had so much fun kind of talking about and exploring, like... There was a point at the end of the podcast, I talked about Lydia in the podcast, and she goes, oh, I'm going to say hi to her. And I go, oh, okay, sure. So I go to get Lydia, and then she st- <laughs> Laura Linney starts dissecting all the stuff in my office. Just trying. It's one of the funniest things that I think has happened in recent memory on the podcast of her just sorting out, oh, he's got that, he's got that. There are these curtains. I wonder what the reason for, you know. Uh, so we left all that in because it was so fun. And But then in talking about her space, she was working out of, she was podcasting out of her home office and had all this great stuff. We were talking about, we we're sort of lamenting one of the things that can be difficult about like the Marie Kondo method is if a lot of things spark joy for you, how do you know what to get rid of? Like some things are very easy. Yeah, I don't need this anymore. Or this is an old bill or this is a thing I haven't taken out of the closet in a long time. But what about things that actually, you're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if I need this. It does kind of spark joy. So she had this box of postcards and she said, look, I've traveled all over the world. Every time I go someplace, I just pick up a postcard. It's just a thing I've done. She goes, I don't really need these. I don't know. I guess I'll throw them away. And I go, hey, what if in the midst of everything that's going on, we could start some sort of a thing like a, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, let's just call it uh, Laura Linney's Postcard Pals. And what you could do is that if people donate to a charity of your choosing, you would write them one of these postcards and actually send it to them. And then they would get a postcard from you, Laura Linney. And then also you would have the satisfaction of knowing that they didn't get trashed. Like they are being shared with people who will cherish them. And so it's sort of like everyone kind of wins, you know, and she goes, oh, my God, I love that idea. So that's what we're doing. Um, She has 50 postcards. So there's only going to be 50 of these. And when they're gone, that's it, because there won't be any more. If you go to ID10T.com, it's up on the website now. You can go. It's $25 Uh, for $25. You are buying a postcard that Laura Linney will write to you and send to you personally. And then that $25, all of it, all of that money will go to the charity she chose, which is the Actors Fund, which is a really wonderful uh, charity. Um, the Actors Fund uh, helps people sort of meet needs that they might have in the if they work in the arts, including emergency financial assistance, affordable housing, health care, insurance counseling, senior care, secondary care. As I'm sure you probably know, like all of the entertainment business is on pause right now indefinitely, and, and many, 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 many people lost their jobs. Um, and I'm not, I'm not talking about like high-paid actors, but a lot of people who work in the arts are not high-paid actors, and they rely on the work that they get to survive, and now that work is gone. So we will donate all of the money that comes in for this to the Actors Fund, and I decided that on top of that, I will match those donations. So for every $25 postcard that you buy, we'll send that money to the Actors Fund. And I also will donate $25 myself to match it. So I don't know, it just seemed like a fun thing all around and a great thing for folks. If you're a fan of Laura Linney, you could get a postcard from her. So join Laura Linney's postcard pals uh, by going to ID10T.com. And as I said, there's only 50. So, uh, so do it quick. Um, and on top of that, Ozark season three is on Netflix right now. So go watch that if you're sitting around, which I imagine you might be. So now's the perfect time to catch up. If you haven't started watching Ozark, uh, you should, and you can catch up and then watch uh, season three as well. It's her and Jason Bateman and uh, just an incredible show. So thank you to Laura Lenny for being just a superb 
human being and someone that was really cool and chill to talk to for an hour. And, uh, and I really had fun on this podcast and I hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe and healthy and please enjoy this, uh, ID 10 T podcast right now with Laura Linney, number 1063. Initiating ID 10 T protocol. on the east coast oh i can imagine what what part of the east coast are you are you in new york i'm right outside of new york yeah, you're outside of new york yeah have you been able to leave the house at all i can i i can because i'm i'm out in the country so there's there's oh. a place to walk around and all that we we left the city when when they shut broadway down mm-hmm. we, we left <laughs> yeah that was uh, that was that was a pretty was yeah time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. If I'm remembering correctly, the theater industry does not like to lose money, right? So that was the biggest, that was, that was, that was a big sign. And there's also just a work ethic that you, that you carry on in, in the theater. You know, that there's, right. the theater also serves a, a purpose for, you know, helping people get through difficult times and providing diversion and, and all that stuff. So for them to shut down the theater was said, spoke volumes to me. <laughs> I would imagine they're taking care of each other. The, the theater community seems incredibly tight, which is probably why the Tony Awards are the most fun awards show. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a remarkable community to be a part of. And, uh, and you're right. Everybody's, everybody's doing everything they can for each other and for, you know, trying to chip in and help out and you know, whatever people can do. Were you working on anything right before this, or I had I had just ended a play two weeks before. Oh my gosh! So I had just stopped. Oh my uh, gosh! Uh, well, by the way, this conversation, like, this will be the breeziest thing in the world. If there's anything you want cut out or anything you don't want to talk, like anything, oh, that's nice. Thank you. It's just the it's just the breeziest thing in the world. Okay. I just want everyone to feel comfortable. And this has actually been we. It wasn't until like a couple weeks ago that we started doing these via Zoom or yeah. Skype initially because I always thought, no, you have to be in front of people because that's how conversation works. Right. And these have actually been great. Oh, I had good. no idea. Well, it's good. Well, I can see you. So that makes it, you know, ju- just audio can be, can, I, I think is, is fine and works in a pinch, but certainly much better to, to see a person's face. It does, but it also sort of feels like, uh, I've done a couple just audio ones and I, I feel yeah. like I'm back in high school uh, where you're just, <laughs> you're just on the phone catching up with people. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. Thinking, of, thinking about that time where you were not accessible at all times. And if yeah. someone called you and you weren't home, you could just say like, Oh, I never, I, I didn't get the message or I wasn't oh. home. Like now we're just yeah. trackable. So sorry. <laughs> not available. I do. I love, I love hate it. I love hate how I, I think it's very fortunate that we're all as connected as we are right now. Thank God for technology right now. There are other times though, where I just feel like I feel chip. Like I feel like there's a chip in me and I'm just trackable at all times. It just yeah, feels. Well, we are, yeah. we are at this point. We are. <laughs> I know. But I think what people, what some people don't know is that different parts of the country are feeling very different things. You know, of New course. York is under a very different set of circumstances than anywhere else in the country for now. Absolutely. And I can hear it in people's voices when I call them when they're, whether they're down South or on the West coast, or there's a, a, a lightness to their voice that you, you don't hear in, in this area. Of course. Right well, particularly in New York, I was saying that's that's like, there's been a culture shock whenever I'm on the phone with someone who's not from this area. Right. Cause they really have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, like, you know, in, in Los Angeles, we're used to, we're, we're used to, um, we have a more, we have more space. We have a bit more space. Yes, absolutely. Um, New York is such a pedestrian culture and it's, yes. I feel like most of the people 
you know, because a lot of people have tiny, tiny little places to live. Yeah. That that's really just a place they go and nap, and then the rest of the time they're just out in the city. And sure. so to be forced to stay in, it just, you know, my heart goes out to people yeah. who are in dense metropolitan areas yeah. who, you know, are, are not. I think it's testing a lot of marriages. It's, <laughs> my wife said that the other night. She goes, I don't mean to be morbid, but do you think the divorce rate's going to go up? And I was like, I know. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But maybe these are relationships that people have uh, been avoiding, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I. You know, and, and for the better as well. I think you, you turn and you look to your partner and you're like, are you the one who I want to be in the foxhole with? Right. Are right. you the person who I want to be facing all this with? Yeah. And I think people are, you know, it causes people to ask themselves some, some serious questions and to feel some intense stuff. Yeah. And there, even when she said it, there was a little bit of pause afterwards and she kind of looked at me and I go, no, this is great. I love being, I, I would not want to be with anybody else. She was like, okay, good. Yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> Like yeah, she, she yeah. Check it in. I'm like this is, but we're homebodies anyway. Do you? Are you? Do you? If you're out in the country, I assume like you probably. How social are you normally? I'm not as social as I think I am. Right. I'm I'm pretty much an introvert by nature, mm -hmm. so I can. I'm pretty comfortable staring at a wall for a long time. So it's so I'm okay. I, I don't feel. People. My husband is not. My husband is 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 an extrovert. Yeah. And he, he needs people and he likes interacting. And so this is much harder for him than it is for me. Oh no. <laughs> Does he, are you like, just walk around the house a couple times, you know, <laughs> go outside. No, you he's doing to... really well. He's been, he's been great, but it's, it's, uh, it, and then it's also the sort of thing where you normally could just sit and stare at the wall, but then when someone tells you, you can't, you know, you can't go outside. Right. Then all of a sudden you want to go outside. So there's all sorts of tricks that your mind is playing with you. I of think. course. Yeah. You you might just have to run your husband around the property like a, we have a puppy right now. We just got to exercise yeah. him, you know, and then yeah. he, we exercise him and he gets he passes out and then he's fine. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what, uh, by the way, I love your office. Um, and am I, is that a Hirschfeld paint illustration behind your head? It is. It's uh, it's 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 not an original. It's of the um, the Algonquin table, the round table. Oh, that's so cool! And then there actually is one original, <laughs> which is over here. Oh my gosh! Which actually is me. Oh, from you can count on me, and I was filming the Mothman prophecies when that was done, and Richard Gere bought it for me. Oh my god! It was one of the nicest things anyone has ever done for me. There was no way I could have ever afforded it. And he bought that for me. That is yeah. epic. I know. I That's know. like a double cool story. Yeah, there you go. Did, yeah. so, wait, you the room is a mess, but I, I love it in here. No, no. Yeah, mine, mine too. I have shit everywhere. I mean, look, that, you know, there's oh, like yeah. car cases. And... I have piles. Do you, I'm a piler. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yes, a thousand percent. It was, my office was starting to look like a, a, a cave with like uh -huh. stalagmites like growing yeah. out of it, but it was just <laughs> yeah. piles yeah. of shit. And I, and I tried to listen to Marie Kondo. I'm like, fuck it, yes. that brings me joy. I don't know. Yes. I'm joy, I'm joy. And then finally my wife was like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to start taking stuff out. I go, Did you, don't do that. Just let me. It's, but she did. She started stacking stuff in the hallway, and I realized, I, like, well, I don't need that. Oh God! Someone sent me this like two years ago. It was a promotional thing. Ah, fuck. So I, I, I had to do that. How do you, how do you get rid of your piles? What's your process for that? You know, I have to just go through it. But I, I then go down such memory lane. You know, it, it takes it takes me a long time. Like I have this here, like this. I can't get rid of. It's a box <laughs> of postcards. Literally a box of <laughs> postcards from like all the trips that I've been on over the years. That's nice. You, know, though. you pick up a postcard like this was from, this is from the Tate modern in London. Very nice. You no. Know, so you just, I have, you know, but do I need them? No. Yeah. But do, do we I need anything? Them? Like we don't yeah. really need 90% of the shit we have. I don't know. It's true. It's so that's true. a tough, I, I would say postcards from travel spark joy because you basically, that was like a scavenger hunt. You went, you, that, that's a, that's a, that's yeah, a living true. diary of your travels. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, it's all, all the museums I've been to. And, and I went into the, the postcard shop at the Met recently, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and there were no postcards. Or the, it used to be like the whole wall. There was one whole enormous wall that used to be postcards of, of the art that you could buy. And I guess the postcard has fallen out of popularity. Oh, that's that seems crazy to me. Yeah, because it broke my heart. I just imagine the like the president of postcards who was like this goddamn email. Honestly, we're going right. under selling one sheet five by seven cards to mail to people. I know. I we know. Did, my best we've friend. Lived, my, we've lived through a, a you know turning tide of the culture. We have. <laughs> one of my best friends had a situation where she was in a post office and there was a girl who was like 19 and the girl went up to her and said, how do I mail a letter? <laughs> she was like, oh are God. you kidding me? So yeah. She had to show her like no, you have I to know. Get a stamp. Yep. Affix it to the thing, and then you set it yeah. in this magic box. Like, I had no yeah. idea. It's the equivalent of the Victrola <laughs> it's or the not. Model T. You know, if you get a handwritten letter from someone, though, doesn't it like? Do you think it's weird, or do you think it's nice that they? Oh, took I the love time? it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it, and I love, and you know, and I also love it when when a person actually has penmanship, right? Which I actually don't have. My handwriting's terrible. It always has been, but. Every once in a while, I'll get a letter from from an actor who's you know maybe a little older than I am, and their their handwriting is so beautiful; it's just gorgeous. You have, and my practice. mother has gorgeous handwriting. My mother has beautiful handwriting. You have to practice that though, because it'll get worse. Uh, it has; it's deteriorating. It was already bad, and now it's it's almost illegible. You would have to just start writing yourself letters. You should write awful. Oh. Those I thought about getting one of those books that you know like, teaches you how to do it. Yes, <laughs> with the you know the tree, trace it and trace it and trace it. I thought about you know doing that one day. Do you mean like the grade school books with the super wide rule and That's like right. the red line That's in right. the middle? I have a son in kindergarten, and he has one of those books, and I might you know I might pill for one. <laughs> it would be funny if he took it to school and the teacher was like, "His penmanship's not uh, improving." Oh, that was actually uh, that was me. Yeah. 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 Sorry, that was my page. Sorry. <laughs> page seven through nine was me. I was bored. You can just give me a thumbs down for the day. Yeah. His penmanship's great. <laughs> are those postcards not filled out? Are they just like empty postcards you were They're going empty to send postcards. People? They're empty postcards. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm getting a crazy idea. I'm going to pitch to you, Laura Linney. Go, do it. Okay. Charity idea. Charity idea. Yes. If people pledge, you know, X amount of dollars to certain charities, maybe for coronavirus relief or whatever, yes. you handwrite them a postcard. That is a great idea. Because then it goes to charity. Then you don't feel like you're just throwing it away. That is a great and idea. It, and that becomes a part of someone else's story. How about to the Actors Fund? To the Actors Fund. Oh, my gosh. I, this is, the postcards might actually have a home. There we go. They'll have a life. I don't know how yeah, absolutely we, I would do that. Okay. I don't yeah. know how to, I don't know if, if, if we can help facilitate this in any way yeah. on social media, we'll, we'll do that. But I just, I love the idea that uh, about 20 bucks for a postcard, 20 bucks for a postcard. How many postcards do you have? A bunch. I think, I think you can probably get more than 20. I think you probably, I'll leave that up to you, to your professional. <laughs> You'll be my agent on this. I'll let you, I've always and priced myself a little low. So. I'll let, I'll let you do that. What's okay. Just, just, just for fun. I know we saw the one in London, but just grab, grab a random one. Grab one. Grab a random one and see if you can uh-huh. tell me a story about that. Oh, trip. Okay. So this. Yep. Italy. Yeah. Oh, where? I think Venice, somewhere in Venice. Oh. It's, a, it's a picture of, um, it's called Dame à l'Hermen. I know that sounds French and not, not Italian. It's a, it's, a, it's a Da Vinci, and it's a beautiful picture of a woman's face. We were at that see. museum last year, less than so a year there, ago. There's that. Let's see. Here, let me pull out something else. That's tape modern. Oh, here's from Australia when I did a movie called Gendabine. Here's some art original. Oh, art. that's really cool. Yeah, there's that. Then I have your typical more touristy postcards of places. Arches National Park <laughs> in Utah. One of my favorite places on the planet. This is one of those places you want to take everyone you love. 
That's gorgeous. You see these things and, and you're so overwhelmed by the beauty of... Did you say that's in Utah? That's in Utah. Yep. Yeah, that it. I love Utah, but driving through Zion National Park was one of the most terrifying things I've uh, ever done in my life. I'm sure. Just because the, the incline is so steep and there's there's a suggestion of a guardrail. Right. And it was to the point where I had to get out of the car. My wife had to drive the rest of the way because she does not have that. I think this is a Roman statue from Bath. Oh, that's gorgeous. You know, yeah. I love Laurel and his pen pal club. I think this is. There you a- go. <laughs> I think this is how many, did, how many do you think you have? What did you say? How many? Ah, uh, I don't know. Maybe a hundred. Maybe. Maybe this not is that good. Many. Maybe this, under a hundred, just under a hundred. This is going to be fun. And then maybe now you'll, you'll even, cause you know, obviously we, uh, there will be a point where we'll be able to travel again and then yeah. you can just amass a whole new uh, yeah. stack of postcards. One hopes. One yeah. Hopes. Have you thought about the first thing you're going to do when, because I think like, well, they're going to, somewhere they're going to go, okay, it's okay to go out and be in public again. I would, I would imagine I will be hesitant, but what's the first thing you think you want to do when you're able to? Well, I think I want to go see my mother. Of course. You know, I think I want to see my relatives, my mother, my stepmother, my aunt, um, my sister, uh, my in-laws. Mm-hmm. My niece and nephew, my sister-in-law, her husband, I think my my immediate family, and then I want to hug my friends. How are, are they are your is your family just strewn out across the country? They are everybody's sort of all over the place. So it's been it, it makes it, you know, for everybody who's dealing with this, it just makes it a little more stressful. Yeah. yeah. Are you, uh, you you said you're introverted. I feel like my wife and I are very introverted as well. It's interesting that a lot of performers are personally introverted, but professionally extroverted. Yes. Yes. I know. <laughs> is that, is that because we crave some sort of a connection you think? So think we so. like, that's how we express. I think so. And I think we crave a deep connection, not just a connection. Right. But one that's a little more than just um, casual. <laughs> right. Right. And I think, I think many of us also feel that we're in service to the material, to the audience, to, you know, at risk of sounding totally pretentious, but to the craft of the art. Right. And that it's not really about us, but about what came behind us and what is coming ahead of us. And we're just the little cog in that, in that um, sort of evolution. Right. Of what we do. So I think, uh, and in order to sort of plug into that, I think you sort of have to be still a lot. Oh, that is such a hard thing to do. And that's what we have to do as a culture is be still. Like be, stillness yeah. is a skill set. Yes. <laughs> you have to befriend the discomfort, you know. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. That is a really great way to put it. I always find every every rehearsal period I'm in, there's always the dr- what's called dreaded week three when you're in rehearsal for a play. Week three always sucks. Mm-hmm. You hate yourself. You hate everyone around you. You feel like you're miserable. You're letting everybody down. You should never have taken the job. They should have hired someone else. You just, you just don't think you're going to make it through. And I, it's a lesson I've learned over and over and over again, that when you get to that point, you have to sit in the discomfort and allow everything to catch up. Mm-hmm. That if you've been doing your work, it's going to be okay, but it has to, you know, it doesn't come together miraculously. You have to let things evolve and join and then sort of harmonize with each other. And then you have to catch up with yourself. And then by the time the show opens, you're, you're almost there, but it's, it's, it's always a shock when you get to that discomfort. It never feels the same. You think it's unique and different. And this is the, the work that will prove that I'm a terrible, terrible professional and that I need to be sidelined immediately. And then you always have to work through it. So you sort of have to sit still and befriend the discomfort and, and just get through it. Which is so interesting because our brains, well, you know, obviously our brains are sort of stratified and the lizard part of our brain hates the discomfort and will actively do whatever it can to not experience discomfort. Sure. But at the same time, we don't evolve without the discomfort. So this is this kind of interesting dichotomy of, the two sides of our brain fighting each other. Yeah. And how every time you go through something like that, 
one part of your brain is like, yeah, you know, this is just a thing that happens. No, no, no. This time it's real. That's I right. know the other thousand yeah. times and you have yeah. to have that argument. Then you become a total drama queen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in the right profession for that. You become a complete narcissist and a total drama queen. And you feel like this has never happened to anyone ever before. And you just, and that's the, that's one of the great things about getting older is that you're, you're able to recognize patterns that, that you've had for a long time. And then you either wise up and you figure out how to deal with it or, or you don't. Oh, I a thousand percent agree. But I also, I do also think that, you know, the, uh, the, the grappling with the narcissism, particularly because, you know, when you're a performer, you, you, you are so inward and you because you're you're constantly, I imagine, trying to process the world and express the world, and you're thinking about how you see the world and how to, and so it's it is like I would imagine always like getting keeping it close enough to be useful, but also at arm's length so it doesn't like fuck up the rest of your life. At the same yeah, time. yeah. And then it's also it's it's good it's a good reminder to remember that other people are going through it as well. Mm-hmm. That someone else might be in like a real state of discomfort and they're trying to figure it out and they're just in that place where nothing's working and you got to give them a little, got to give them a little space. Right. Keep, keep a little kindness there for I someone who's, who's in the middle of their process. You, you have to respect that. It's kind of funny to think about the things that probably just upended us in our twenties. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So easily. Yeah. Like, you know, just like, and you fall apart. Some <laughs> blows at you and you just fall, fall to pieces. <laughs> You're just so fragile. That is, that is the nice thing is, is to recognize that, um, you know, that uh, things tend to most things, not all, but most things do tend to work out. More Some than, of the time, not always. Not always. Not always. But, but even when they don't, they still can because yeah. something not working out can actually be a good thing in the long run. Sure. And you also only have control over so much. Right. You, you can take care of yourself and that's really about it. Yeah. Do you have a, uh, do you meditate or do you have like a series of mantras? Like what do you do to sort of decontaminate the... I I do meditate. Yeah. I do meditate. Yeah. I do that. I have, if I'm doing a play, I have a whole sort of, I get to the theater very early. I like to be there. I like to warm up on stage. You know, I'd spend time there um, so that it becomes very familiar. And is for you, is it about getting as comfortable as possible to be able to, I mean, do you, exactly? you do, you do. Yeah. 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 And I, I sort of, and, the way I know I can relax is if I know I'm pre- as prepared as I can possibly be, mm-hmm. that will get me to a place where like, well, I've done everything I can do. Right. So now I just do it. And now we see what happens. But That's if I feel like I've, if I feel like I've sort of shortchanged myself or someone else or the play or my cast or then it's, then it's really bad. I mean, <clears throat> that's the part where, having some kind of faith in yourself or faith in that things will be okay or that you'll figure it out. That's the hard one to, that's the hard one to get because everything. You have to have have a process in order to have faith in the process. Right. So you sort of have to know how to work in order to have faith in that. And again, that just takes age and experience. Yeah, and exactly. You can only, you only get that from doing something like a million times. That's right. That's before right. You, before you go, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. fuck up a million times. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, royally. I have been in some horrifically bad productions, really <laughs> famously bad. And they were brutal. And I'm glad they happened early on. I mean, it's, it, it's a miracle. I kept working because these, these productions were really terrible. And, um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot from them. Which is, that's the gift part where you realize, number one, it didn't tank everything. You survived it and it made you better. Thank thank you, Jesus. But aren't there productions where you can't, it's like there's, there's only so much you can do as an actor in like, it's not just an ensemble of other actors. It's an ensemble of a whole production, you know? So what do you, like everything, everything has to go. Yeah. Everything has to align. Right. And it's hard. And, it, and then it also makes you just appreciate really great work because mm-hmm. you know how hard it is. You yeah. know that it's not, it's not what I call instant pudding. You don't just add water and go like it's a lot. 
Right. So when I see something that's really good now, I just am, you know, beside myself with happiness. I mean, I really am just overwhelmed. Uh, do you have one that, do you have a, do you have a good sort of a, a theater fail that you're comfortable sharing? Like oh, of a production Lord. or like just a fun, just one that oh, you can look Lord. back and laugh at and go, ah, you know. Well, the there, were a, there were several and they were all great classics. So I got out of Juilliard and I was cast in like three cla- I was cast in the seagull in Hedda Gobbler and an Uncle Vanya, you know, out of, out, right out of school. Mm-hmm. And all three were just really problematic, <laughs> really <laughs> bad. And so I just, I felt like I was, you know, responsible for injecting the beast that is the theater with a deadly virus. I really thought like classic plays, I'm, I'm just in one bad classic play after another, and this is not good for the cause. <laughs> you know, I'm not helping. <laughs> I'm not helping the case for doing classical theater on Broadway. So that was, that was brutal, you know, and you, and you know it, and it's bad, and you know it's bad, and you know you're bad in it, and you just, it was like going to the theater and someone every day handing me a glass of sand and saying, drink up. <laughs> it was just, it was brutal. And you just feel awful for everyone. You just feel, you just want to turn to the audience and go, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've wasted your time and your money. I so, I apologize. <laughs> it is brutal. <laughs> brutal. My heart, my heart starts to race whenever I even think of those productions. And it's been, you know, over 25 years or something. But that's what's so great, though, is that oh. it, it, you, you, you survive, you know, you survive it. You, you, yeah. you get through it. And it, probably- it also makes, it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's, it's also when something goes right, then you're so relieved. And yeah. you don't take it for granted. You know. Well, if everything were flawless right out of the gate, then one of two things would be true. Number one, I don't think that would be great because you'd never learn. You wouldn't have a, a barometer for what was, you wouldn't appreciate the good stuff. It would all be, well. or number two, you're very distorted <laughs> and you think everything is amazing and it's not. And so I really, you're right. Like of all the times to have that happen, like right out of school, yeah. it's a great time. Yeah. I felt like I was being flayed alive at the time, but it was, you know, I would, I was embarrassed. I was just so embarrassed and I just felt awful, but it was, it was a really, you know, now that I look back, it was all, it all made sense. When you started working in film, what was the, was the, was the goal to just keep working as much as possible? Was it to select specific kinds of roles or was it just like, well, I'm an actor. I just need to, I just need to act. I just need to work. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, I just wanted to work and I just wanted to experience whatever I could. Mm -hmm. You know, I was open to to anything Um, and I knew nothing about film and television and really had no ambition for film and television either. It was not in my culture growing up. I just I mean, I loved going to the movies. I loved watching television of course but i i was never comfortable with the camera in my face mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was just not what i thought i would ever do i really just thought i was a theater brat and that's where i would be and that's where i wanted to be so film and tv were were the big surprise for me really the big surprise i just was very intimidated by cameras and and the culture i just didn't know anything about it i just knew it was different and foreign and i didn't quite understand it so I was very lucky because I had a really smart first agent um, who's no longer alive, but his name was Brian Reardon, and he was just a gem of a human being. And he could tell that that's sort of where my mindset was. And he very gently said, just why don't you just check it out? Just, you know, let's see, let's go audition for this one day, a part in something for one day. So I did a very small part in a movie called Dave. And then I did a very small part in a movie called Searching for Bobby Fisher. So I had like one day here, one day there. Then I did, I think, two days on Lorenzo's Oil. And then then he started sending me out for things that were a little larger. And it just sort of, so I grew into it. And then by the time I got to Tales of the City, the first one, I just had a ball. I loved it. And that that was the turning point for me, was that show. Where I was like, oh, maybe I could enjoy this. You know, maybe I, I, I won't suck at it and maybe I'll actually enjoy it. 
and and that proved to be the case. And you get more than one take, you know. And you get, yeah, wild, you know. So it was it was uh, it was great. By the way, you you glanced over what were some phenomenal some of my favorite movies of the '90s. Dave, Kevin Klein, yeah. And didn't you play the aide that he has a stroke? Like he's having an affair that's with right. her, and then he yes, has he died stroke. on top of me. Yes, that's a pivotal. <laughs> That's a one day a pivotal role yeah. in that yeah. movie. Yeah, and searching with Bobby Fischer is also. I, I was in chess club in grade school. I played chess oh, really? excessively, and yeah. that's a gorgeous movie. It's a beautiful movie, isn't that a beautiful movie? It's gorgeous. That movie is yeah. stunning. It's yeah, it's, it's a such really a stunning movie. movie, and not a movie that I hear as much. Like that's a movie that people are listening to this right now. Go watch Searching for Bobby Fischer. Yeah. It is a. Yeah. It's 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 like a bittersweet, gorgeous, feel-good, yeah. uplifting kind of a movie. It's stunning. And I look like a baby Muppet in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's baby Muppet Laura Linney in there. <laughs> <laughs> but when did you start to feel like, hey, you know what? You said you started having fun after a handful, but when did yeah. you, when did you kind of go, I think this might be a significant part of my path. I feel like did you kind of relax into it? Did you always sort of feel like, well, I think I'm in a, I'm in a momentum now that I'm going to work as kind of as long as I feel like working. I don't know if I've ever felt that way, to be honest. Um, I think you get more confident with your ability to do the work. Mm -hmm. Um, But you never feel like it's going to keep going. Wow. You know, I think that's, I think that's true for, for most, for most people with half a brain. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And it's probably just a healthier that way anyway, because it, then you appreciate it more when it happens. Absolutely. And Absolutely. yeah. And then you're not, yeah. Again, cause the danger I think is just pinning all of your, your ego and everything on something that you can't control. Yeah. Yeah. And then if something happens, then yeah. I mean, like you know, we're all in a situation where we literally can't control what's going on in the outside world. Yeah, and we're sort of forced to just. Huh, well. I think it's also you can also see like the actors who have who've had a tremendous amount of success, and then you see them get bored. Mm-hmm. I can see it in their work. Yeah, they're just bored. Yeah, they're tired of being on set. They're sick of the hours. They want to go home. They're cranky. They're irritable. They're and I get that. There's a lot on a film set that can make you that way. Mm-hmm. But I, it, it always breaks my heart a little bit when I'll see a great actor sort of reach a level and they've just been drowned in um, uh, privilege. Right. And the privilege of being able to keep working and working so much. And then, and then they just get bored up there and you can see it. How do you think you avoid that? Just because it seems like, you know, everyone, when you start out, you have this idea of something that you want to achieve and then you start to achieve it, but then it's not enough. And then you want more and then it's not enough. And then, and then at a certain point, it's like, well, there's no more, like you're it, like that you're at the ceiling of, you know, whatever that kind of external thing is. So how, how do you think, how, how does someone prevent that from happening from taking, you know, from taking stuff for granted and from getting that boredom? People are, I think it's human nature and somewhat to drown in privilege that way. I think it's when someone is, I think it's, it's, it's very hard not to, I would think. Um, I think you, a, you have to really love the work itself, Mm -hmm. regardless of what form it comes in. Um, And I think you have to do it for not yourself. (laughs) I think it has to not be about you. Right. You know, well, and then especially at a certain point, everyone, I, I would imagine a very kind of distorted thing happens where everyone's just telling those people everything they're doing is great. No one wants to upset the apple cart, so they don't. But, yeah. yeah know, so they're not challenged. And they're, they're not, not challenged. They're not and no, oh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, you know, they, yeah. they start acting up and then it's like, oh, let's let them, you know. And there, there's, there's no real balance. I do really yeah. think that human beings need some kind of a structure or a balance or a, even a slight opposing force to just sure. not get. Well, I think also when their sense of trust starts to erode. Right. You know, 
when they feel like they're just being exploited for the the type of work that they do or people aren't speaking to them honestly or right you know people are telling them they're terrific when they know they're not right you know, the trust the trust starts to break down and and you're spoken to in a sort of juvenile way right or someone just talks to you in platitudes all the time then then you do check out you do check out do you think that's the time when you just have to do something else or you have to like, how do you, how do you think someone think you have to find different people to work with different people? Yeah. You have to be with like-minded people. Right. Otherwise it will drive you crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, hard, the job is too hard. There's, there's too much to do under difficult circumstances and you, you have to be with like-minded people. Well, that's why I think the I do, I think the meditation stuff is important because I think you kind of have to get to know yourself and be comfortable with yourself in order to even have the awareness to make a decision. Like, I think I need to be around different people or I think I need to do X, Y, or Z to rekindle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even if that's stepping away from a lot for a while or or whatever. Absolutely. And then also to to get rid of the desire to not punish the people who are not (laughs) like-minded. Right. (laughs) You know, you start to get so resentful. Um, well, they're really lashing then, out. At then themselves. you can behave really badly. People can behave really badly. But they're I mean, lashing out at themselves, really. Like they're yes. uh, they're just yeah. angry, and uh, yeah. you know, anyone who steps into that That's right. last radius yeah, is going to get it. And then there's self loathing that comes, and oh, it's just a joy. <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, fortunately for me, I've been I've I've had a few situations like that, and no one in this business behaves well a hundred percent of the time. So I, I certainly have days that I wish I could take back um, where I, you know, stepped in it or didn't handle myself as well as I would like to. Um, but pr- pretty much most of the time I've, I've been, I've, I've had a good time. Is there anything that you do? Like, well, I'm just going to do this for me. I don't care if anyone sees this thing or not. I just oh, sure. really special oh, yeah. about this. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, they're, they're, you respond to material in ways that like I, when I, when I'm reading a script for the first time, if my actor brain turns on and if I start working on it involuntarily before I finish reading it, then I know I just have to do it. Yeah. I just, you know, doesn't matter. Like I should do it. If I've already started working on it by the time I've reached page 25, then, (laughs) then, you know, I have to listen to that. And then I imagine it at that point, do you, sit down with the director and have a chat and just sort of see like, Oh, are we on the same page? Does this kind of make sense? I probably should do that more than, more than I do. (laughs) But most of the time I'll just sort of go with my gut and, you know, and, and the opposite. There've been times where I've read scripts that are not so great, Mm -hmm. that there's not a whole lot there that I can, I can't find my way in or I don't really understand it. And I'll still say yes, because the people are so fantastic. Well, that's, that's enough then. Yes, absolutely. And if and if someone is willing to work with you, you know, then that that goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably just the trick of finding whatever that nugget of I mean, God, this is more yeah. condo shit, finding that nugget of joy <laughs> in whatever it is. <laughs> sure. Yeah, the intersection. There's like usually there's some intersection somewhere. Yeah. That you just completely understand. Yeah. And you might not even be able to formulate it and, and, and express it in, in a way that, that makes sense. But there's some understanding that you have about either the story or the character or the narrative or the plot, or there's something that, that makes you realize, oh, I'm going to learn something doing this. Right. You know, like I, this will, this will change me somehow. Right. You know, I'll, 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 I'm going to be a different person on the other side. That's a fun way to think about it. And I also think you, you know, like the gut that you have, you earn, you earn your gut, right? There's probably like 0.1% of people are born with some sort of a genetic pre it's like a confluence of astrology and genetics and something. And they (laughs) just know their shit and they're super, but in general, like most mortal human beings, I feel like we do have to earn our guts um, through trial and error, but how, like, how do you know, like, how do you know, you know, when, when it's, when it's your gut talking or it's like your ego whispering in and disguising itself as a gut, like, how do you, how do right. you know? Well, I, I, 
think you know what you know. <laughs> yeah. And then you, and then it's always a bit of a gamble. And you also have to know going into it, like what this could possibly be mm -hmm. and realizing that you're saying yes to this. And, you know, it could be like, it's a great script, but it's in a swamp in Louisiana and it's all nights. <laughs> like, you know, you have to be, you have to have the experience to know what that means. Right. What that means is all night long in a swamp with mosquitoes the sizes the size of alligators. You know, do I do I really want to do that? But if I say yes, then I know what I'm getting myself into. Got it. And again, that's where experience pays off a little bit. And you're like, you okay, so this this director is known to be a, a screamer, a yeller, yeah. but he makes beautiful, great things. Is it is he going to all of a sudden be a a a friendly, you know, puppy dog around me? No, he's going to scream and yell around me too. And is that worth, is that worth it? You know, so you just have to really think things through and then you have to be like, okay, I'm an employee and I, I said I would do this. So I have to do my part, you know? That's a good way to think about it too, because you're basically, you're doing all the pre-work to set yourself up yeah. for success mentally in your own head. Like, you know, rather than just let's just jump into it and see what happens. Cause there is an element to that, but you still gotta, you yeah. still have to know what the agreement is. That's right. And if yeah. it's a low budget movie for two cents, yeah. that's teetering on the brink of coming together or not, you have to know what that means production wise. Right. And what that, how that production is going to go. And right. if you go in, then you go in like all hands on deck wanting to help, and that's what you've signed up for. Mm -hmm. So, so then so you, you, sort of, you sort of don't have the right to complain and, you know. Exactly. You if you get there and you're like, so this sucks. This guy yelled at me and the mosquitoes are big. Like, yeah, you, right. you knew that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you knew that going in. But I think that's probably where, why the theater training is so great because you you just have to make, when you're in a theater, I'm, and I'm not a theater person. I mean, I've never really done theater, but it seems to me that y'all just figure it out. You just have to make it work because you don't have a choice. You have to make it work one way or another. True. Yeah. And you rely on each other. And that's the one thing the theater has that there are two things that the theater has that film and television do not. And time is one of them. Just like what time does. Um, it's a, it's an element within a production that you can't, you can't force it. You can't ge generate the, the results that time, how time works on you and works on a production and works on a performance and, you know, what it does in the, in the ingredients of everything. Mm -hmm. There's that. And then there's also, you're all interdependent and you know each other really well, <laughs> whether you want to or not. <laughs> and in film, you can, you know, you can barely work with people, even if you're on a long running series or, if you're in a movie and I mean, there'd be people who I've been in movies with who I've never met, you know, so it's, 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 those are the two big differences for me. That, that is so interesting. Cause I, it makes me think again, like why the Tony awards are so fun. And it's like, because as an industry, it's an ensemble, but yeah. film and television is really more about like the individual focusing on their own, like to it, you know, obviously yeah. you have to do scenes with people, but I mean, in general, I feel like it much more fosters um, isolation film and television rather yeah, than the community yeah. theater. Like, hey, we're all in the same boat. You know, sometimes right. it's great, sometimes it sucks, but we that's all right. get through it together. That's right. And there's a real respect and, you know, a real generosity that everybody in the theater has for everyone else because we know how hard it is. Like eight shows a week is no joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No one knows what that is unless you've done eight shows a week for a long period of time. And there's a tremendous amount of, you know, goodwill in the theater. People are so happy for each other when they do well. Yeah. They really are. They really are. And it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's so moving. It always, it always has been. You know, there's this, there's this great thing that happens in the theater. When your show opens, every other production on Broadway sends a notice to your theater saying, happy opening. Oh, and great. everyone signs it. So there's a whole wall of the entire like Broadway docket is up on a wall and the entire cast of every show has signed like good luck, good wishes, break a leg. And they mean it. And they mean it. 
So this might be a crazy this might be a crazy swing, but go with me as much as you feel comfortable. I'm with you. With so, I'm with you. So the idea that because theater can be so tumultuous, you know, the ups and the downs, yes. but yeah. everyone gets through the discomfort together, and as a result, there is a camaraderie and a community. And it's also athletic. Yeah, of course. You know, emotional and physical. Absolutely. But you all go through it together. So. As a world, as an as an international, as a species right now, humans are going through this fucked up, uncomfortable thing, this awful yes. thing. Yes. Is it is it possible or is it um, too, uh, I don't know, Pollyanna to hope that what is on the other side of this is a stronger sense of community because we have all been through this fucked up thing together and we're all sort of in the same boat in a, you know, um, where obviously the stakes are incredibly high. Is part of it going to be like, oh, we are, we're not as divided as we felt before. We're actually, we're, we're much closer. I hope so. I, I hope so. I kind of doubt it, but I hope so. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the people in New York will be bonded in a way. I think all the hot spots, the people will be bonded, but then there are all the conspiracy theories, people who believe that nothing's happening. Right. Right, right, right. You know, that's very real. Yeah. There are a bunch of people out there who don't believe any of this is happening. Right. And, you know, I think that causes more of a rift, a deeper rift. Right. You know, I mean, when you see scientists being doubted and shamed (laughs) and threatened, and you know, when you see doctors being belittled and, you know. It's, that's not good. But that to me just feels like internet culture. Do you know what I mean? Where it's, there's going to be a, there are going to be haters for literally everything. Yes. And, yeah. But the, but I feel like the majority of people, you know, separate from the sort of the, the extreme outliers, because I, I do, I think, you know, what social media excels at is elevating extreme points of view. Yes. Um, and so, I mean, much in the same way that, you know, when you, I don't know if they're still at the grocery store anymore, but when the tabloids are, you know, filled the racks at grocery stores before the internet, it was just all these crazy tabloid stories. Yeah. That were, that, all these extreme points of view, because that just sold newspapers, you know? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the social media stuff works in the same way. And so I try to take that with a grain of salt because I feel like, yeah, but that's the, that's like this many people, but they're just loud. Yeah. But the majority well, it, of people. Well, what it does do is it, it belittles expertise. Yeah. And unfortunately, it influences people who make decisions who are trying to make a lot of money. Right. And they will go with uh, the lowest common denominator if they feel it's going to make them more cash. Right, 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 right. So culturally, it has, it erodes the culture. And it erodes a a logic yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, yeah. and I'm not saying all of that is bad. And I, and I know that, that there can be a, a sense of elitism with, with expertise, but uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think culturally we're in a very, very dark place. Shit, I really thought I had a good comparison, but now that I'm now that I'm talking it out, it's like it's not the same thing at no, all. No, but I I wish you were right. I, and it should be that way. It might be for some people. Right. It, it might should, be for some people. It might be for some people, and let's hope. Let's yeah. let's hope it is. Yeah. You know, but I, I think we're in such a strange, precarious place as a culture and as a nation. Mm-hmm. You know, just if you're not thinking globally, I mean just America. It's it's a it's an intense period of time for something like this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully, and this obviously is a very difficult discomfort to embrace, but at least, you know, as individuals, maybe we can all do our part to figure out and be reflective and, you know, when things are good again, when th- and things will be, you know, things will normalize. How will I contribute and how will I be a part of that? Because I think, it's so easy to go, oh, they are doing this or they are not doing that. 
and sometimes you forget like, well, what am I doing and what am I contributing? That's right. Yes. Because each individual, it really does matter. Yeah. Because people are made up of individuals. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think about the people, there are a lot of people I know who, who just are reactive. Mm -hmm. They just react. So they're the people who, re who react in a big way, but actually don't do anything. Right. And then they're the people who don't react and do a lot. Mm -hmm. And then everybody in between. So it's interesting to see like who, uh, you know, and it's moments like this where you do, uh, I think parts of your character are exposed whether you want it to be or not. Right. Well, I think there are probably going to be a lot of divorces when it's all over. <laughs> 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 oh my you know, god! I didn't realize. As it turns out, we're assholes together. That's right. Oh. Yeah. Or, or the opposite. People will will make full commitments to each other and be like, you know, your your, your character has been exposed, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a serial killer. I'm a serial killer. That's right. Yeah. It's like that. It's like that. Uh, that I, I mean. I, I say horrible, but it's like horrible, great. The old, I don't know if you remember the uh, the Rupert Holmes Pina Colada song where, yes. you remember that song? Oh, yeah. Where it's oh, like, yeah. oh, he's tired of his relationships, so he writes an That's ad right. and the classifieds, yeah. which is something That's people right. used to do. He goes on Tinder, basically. Yeah, he goes on Tinder, which in the 70s and 80s. You know, as yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the classified ads? Let's go get drunk, fuck on a beach. <laughs> Let's go. Come Swiping on. right was buying a newspaper, hey, yeah. circling an ad with a pen, <laughs> calling a number that was like Klondike 4321. Hello. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But in the song, he's looking for something yeah. else. He meets. And then it's his, I, I believe it's his own lovely lady. It's his own talking. lovely lady. And she his said, oh, it's you. Who was just as bored and fed up with him as he was with her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they should have ended up together in that song. I'm getting out of here. I mean, <laughs> at no time in the conversation where they ran into each other, like, wait a minute, you're trawling the classified ads yeah. when we're yeah. in a committed fuck you, you know? Like, That's right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Go get tested for chlamydia right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Here's the number of the doctor. Go take a test, you son of we'll a We'll go bitch. together, all right? Fuck well, you. Yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> I like the yeah. coda to that song. There's like, there's a, there's another verse that he'd never finished. Uh, yeah, it was all right. about dealing with the aftermath of them right. almost cheating on each other and yeah. possibly had been the, the entire time. Yeah. But they seemed like a groovy couple. <laughs> <laughs> they were a groovy couple. Uh, well, yeah. that, not to go on too much of a, of, of a tangent, but that guy was, that guy wrote like a lot of weird pop yacht rock novelty songs. Do you remember his other less popular song no, what was, was it? about answering machines? All and right. it's, it's, it's a weird song, but it's about a guy trying to ask a woman to marry kids. Like right when answering machines came out. Yeah. Yeah. And the chorus of the song is so it, it just grates on your, it just like takes your yeah. brain like a block of Parmesan and just scrapes it. You can't unhear it. Can you, you can't unhear it, but it's like, I'm so sorry. You have just reached my answering machine. And the whole buy of the song is he's trying to ask this girl to marry him on the, on the, on the answering machine. And it keeps cutting him off before he gets uh -huh. to the end. Serves and him then, right. Yeah, exactly. Serves him right. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what the Make fuck was going on in that guy's life. But it, yeah. <laughs> um, do you sort of feel like um, when you had a child, did that kind of put things more into perspective for you as well? Did that, would, did that help kind of click some stuff into place as well? Uh, no, I think I was so, I didn't think I was, I didn't think being a parent was going to happen for me. Mm -hmm. So I had sort of mourned that and given that up. And uh, so then when it did happen, you know, there was just, a, a, an overwhelming sense of gratitude uh -huh. that um, and I was so ready for it. <laughs> I was so ready for it. And everyone kept saying your life is going to change. Your life is going to change. I was like, good. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for my life to change. I want my life to change. Yeah. So, and I can remember being, you know, like awake with my son at four in the morning and he wasn't sleeping well for this period of time. And, 
And I can remember like hearing people complain about, which is understandable. I don't, I don't mean to knock people complaining about not being able to sleep when they have a newborn. But I was so grateful to be up at four in the morning with a newborn because I really didn't think it was ever going to happen. And so for me, it wasn't, um, I, I didn't have that moment where everything changed. It was just a profound um, relief isn't, isn't the right word, but it was just a, um, something just fit into place finally. Mm-hmm. You know, there was just a missing piece and it just, it just fell into place. And um, so it's, it's been, it's been wonderful, you know. That's great. Does he understand, does this just sort of feel like, are you presenting this like it's a summer vacation kind of a situation? No, he knows. He knows. I mean, he misses his school. He's six now. So we're homeschooling, which is a challenge. <laughs> they don't want to learn from us. <laughs> they don't want to learn from their parents. My kid looks at me like, you want me to do what? <laughs> but we've been, we've been having a good time with it. And he's, um, no, but he knows there's a virus and he knows that, you know, we have to stay inside and we're, we're very fortunate and we're in a very nice place. So it's not, it's not a hardship for anybody where, where we are right now. So um, he misses his friends and he's sad about that. Yeah. But he's also loving the time with just us. And he also has no understanding of the real chaos and stress that this, nor should he, you know, that this is globally causing um, and the fear of the unknown about what's going to be on the other side. But so he's, he's so happy that it makes it easier for us, you know? Oh, that's good. Yeah. And he keeps us on a schedule. You know, I'd be sleeping till 11 and wake up depressed and freaked out. But, you know, we're up at seven and we make the breakfast and then we go to homeschooling and then, you know, there's math and there's reading and there's this, then it keeps us on a schedule. So it's been. And it gets you out of your own head too, because you can't focus on. Without a doubt. Stuff. Yeah, no. When you got to keep a little, a little human. No, absolutely. Up and around. Yeah. Yeah. Have you sort of figured out like, these are the windows. He's very active from this period to this period, you know, like he can take a nap here. I can go off and do this. Like, is it, is it pretty, is it very, very regimented? Well, it's a little regimented, but you know, the minute he has to sit in a chair and do work, he just starts to yawn. (laughs) (laughs) So it's about trying to, trying to get him, you know, get the wheels moving. Let's get the mental wheels going. I'm telling you, you know, the only thing is great about that is how, how often would do parents get to see what their kids are like at school? You know what That's I right. mean? No, you're, it's true. You're, you're seeing a window into like, That's Oh, right. so this is how it is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's and and how they surprise you, how they're really so f- much more far ahead than you think they are in some things and yeah. further behind in others. And so it's a wonderful way, you know, having this time, you do get to know your kid in ways that you, that you don't, you know, you know what? I, this I think a kid probably would have fixed that couple in the Rupert Holmes song. I think if they had a kid, that would have fixed. <laughs> they should... Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know why I'm so fixated on that. It just... I know. Well, we could write a whole novel. There could be a whole thing. The, you know what would be really fun is uh, a play based on, but like a really dramatic, like really deep dive kind of soul crushing, like what it, the play starts with that song and then the yeah. play starts, you know. Where like, they are now. Yeah, with, with where they are now. Well, maybe they've had to, maybe they've been separated for 25 years and <laughs> they're, they're, you know, their drug addict son has brought them back together for some reason or something. Oh you know? God, I know we're making jokes, but that sounds really yeah. good. It sounds right, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Return to the yeah. Pina Colada song. Or maybe you no. Know, maybe it's family week at a rehab. <laughs> That's what, <laughs> my parents met under very strange circumstances. My I, yeah. I was born under very strange circumstances. My parents were going right. to break up during a reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Conceived they, under the reconciliation of, of right after that song was sung. But the kid doesn't fully understand. I don't know. Some newspaper got him back to. I don't know how that worked. Really, yeah. I don't. It was like I don't really understand how it worked. Yeah. Anyway, if you're writing anything while in isolation, this might be a fun that's, thing for you to it. work on. I don't know. Are you writing anything? No, I'm not a writer. Did you ever think that you wanted to be or did you always? No, know? no, I, I write. I, I do write. I, should, I shouldn't say I don't write. I write 
I write speeches, you know, I go around and do some speeches here and there. And so I do, I do that. Um, but my father was a playwright. So I sort of thought that was his world and I didn't really, didn't really feel the need to dip in there. Right. Just, um, you know, never say never, who knows. Right. But um, I really love what I do. Yeah. I, I really do. And I'm not done there. Like I don't, I, f- I still feel like there's so much more to learn. Absolutely. So much more to do. So I'm not, I sort of don't want to take the time away from that. I know that sounds crazy, but. No, that's not crazy at all. And, and again, you know, it's appreciation, curiosity. It, it's just all those great things that, that keep it fresh to prevent you. Yeah. Do you think you would recognize, would, would you be able, if you started to, it doesn't sound like you ever will, but if at a certain point you started to get that boredom, would you be like, I, I don't need to, I, I, th- I need to do something to step away for a second. Like, would you recognize it if you sure. felt it? Yeah. I mean, and I've had those moments. I've had moments where I'm like, I got to stop or I can't do this and this type of work. I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? So, you know, I, I, I have moments like that. Um, and then you do have to sort of just like take a good hard look at why you're in the situation you're in what, how much of it you're responsible for and, and then make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. You know, if it keeps happening, if you get into some pattern about, about that, and then you're just constantly hitting your head against a wall, that's, you have to look at yourself a little deeper, I think. But again, those are the moments of discomfort that help you have hopefully some sort of a breakthrough or some sort of evolution or some sort of a grow. You grow you know, and shit, you which grow. people are supposed to do. You grow a little. By the way, um, uh, I should 100% mention that Ozark <laughs> is now that people, but I would imagine people are watching Ozark because everyone's stuck. Everyone's like, stuck at home on a couch. Everyone, and like running out, and it seems funny that it's, uh, it, it's such a beautiful time to be at home a lot because there is a wealth of amazing yeah, things to watch. See, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, whether it's Netflix or HBO or the Criterion Collection or, you know, Turner Classic Movies or, you know, there's a lot at your disposal. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot to see. Ozark came out a couple of weeks ago, so people can already see it if they haven't yet but I would imagine most people probably, probably have. How, in that case, how did you, when Ozark came along and they said, okay, it's going to be a series. Did you, were you first like, well, I don't know if I want to do a series or did it take some convincing or you just immediately thought it was. Well, I, I really, I wasn't looking to do a series. I really didn't want to do a series at that point. And but I had always really liked Jason Bateman. Yeah. <laughs> I had known him socially very, the tiniest, tiniest amount. But every time I saw him, I just always really liked him. And I always had a suspicion that there was more there than he had been doing. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, you'll meet someone who's known for one thing. Yeah. And you think, oh, they can do a lot more than that. Yeah. You know, I always felt that way about Hugh Grant as well. I was like, he's deeply talented. Yeah. And I saw how he worked. I'm talking about Hugh at the moment. And I was like, there's, he can do a lot more. And so I've been so happy for him over the past few years to see all the work that Hugh Grant's been doing because it's so spectacular. And, and I felt the same way about Jason. I was like, he can, there's a lot there. And, and so I was, you know, so happy to see that he was going to jump into this knowing that really, you know, the main reason he was jumping into it because he, he wants to direct and keep directing and he loves it and he's so good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was one of those situations where the script, I saw the script and the part was really not great at all. Um, and I, Jason and I talked and, and then I talked to the showrunner, Chris Mundy, who is an exceptional human being and a great showrunner. <laughs> and, um, I talked to him for a long time and it turned out we went to college. We went to the same college at the same time, but didn't know each other. I knew his roommate. Isn't that funny? Um, And he just, I just trusted him. There was no reason for me to trust him, but I just did. And, and thank God I did. Um, 
And it's been, it's been one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. Between Jason, our lead producer, Patrick Markey, and Chris Mundy, the three of them are just the best at their jobs. And it's, it's been heaven. And I knew right away, I was like, oh boy, we have all fallen into a pot of honey here. And this is sweet as it gets. <laughs> I mean, it's just, because you have experiences where the crew is great and the cast is great and you're all having a great time and the work sucks. Right. And then you have the, the other jobs where the work is so good, but making it almost killed you. Mm-hmm. And you come out bruised and bitter and upset and, uh, you know, all of tra- traumatized, really. <laughs> but this has been just amazing all the way around. So we are, and we know it, like we know it. We know how good this is. And uh, we're, it, it's just heaven. It really is. I love going to work every day with these people. It is pretty incredible how in the last <clears throat> 10, 12 years, this new sort of subgenre of like a series that's really just a long movie. Like it's not yeah. the idea of what a series is. Right. The lines well, are very blurred. Well, because no one's making movies. All the film people have been, have merged into the television world. Right. You know, all the actors, the cinematographers, the designers, the producers, the, so it's had to evolve. Mm-hmm. If you're going to have people who are accustomed to working in a certain way, you know, the culture of television has had to make room for that and change. Mm -hmm. And, and they have. Yeah. And, you know, you have places like Netflix, which is, you know, you hear what a wonderful company they are to work for, particularly artistically, because they, they hire really good people and then they let them do what they need to do. Yeah. And, and that's very unusual. Yeah. And, you know, Jason and Chris and Patrick created the show together and, you know, it's just been, it's been wonderful. Well, this has been an absolutely wonderful chat. I, an hour just flew by and Zoom. yeah, just like, <laughs> just like that. I feel like we've gotten some great life uh, stuff. Also a postcard collection. Which there you go. Could be a hey. charity situation in the not too absolutely. distant future. Um, but it's, it's just been such a pleasure to talk to you. Well, same and here. I really like, I, I like when I, uh, get to meet people that I'm already a fan of and like, and they're fucking cool too. You know, like, it's just, <laughs> oh, thanks. It's just a nice, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll bore my wife with it just going on and on. Like if, you know, oh, you know, like if something comes on and someone's going to go, oh, they're so great. You know, they do this, this or this or this. And she go, I know, let's watch the movie, you know? So, but it, this has been so pleasurable. And well, is I, she there? What is she? She's downstairs. Can I say hi? Oh yeah. Hang on. Let me see if she's. Go she's, get her. All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go grab my wife to say hi. One Great. I'll stare. I'll stare at your office. <laughs> what can I learn? Oh, look, there's an alligator mouth back there. And there's a green blob. I don't know what the hell that is. A guitar. Guitar cases on the floor. An old typewriter. Looks like an encyclopedia behind a glass bookcase. Maybe a portrait of a relative or just a creepy old looking person. Who knows? Hmm. Hmm. And then shades are drawn on the door and the window. Either privacy or lighting aid. Who knows? All right. She's coming up. (laughs) She was just walking our puppy. We had a puppy like two weeks before all this happened. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Well, if that's great, you'll have tons of time to train the dog. Well, we have, yeah. But we're trying to, the interesting part about what's been going on lately is we're starting to realize like, oh, we need to isolate him a couple times a day because he's not going to know what it's like to be without us. That's right. Yeah. So he's starting to, you know, he gets, has a little bit of separation anxiety, but he's, he's only three and a half months old. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Do you Congrats. have any pets? No. A six-year-old is enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like maybe I'm, I'm at the point now where maybe we can add a fish. Yeah. But, just, yeah. Like, you know, my, my son wants a dog. My husband wants a dog. I'm like, no, <laughs> not right now. No. Yeah. I have to say <laughs> it's been an amazing uh, distraction. Yeah. To, it's a lot of work. Yeah. 
at first it's a lot of they does, do they still have the puppy teeth there's really, really he's sharp starting teeth. to lose them yeah the puppy teeth are starting to go he's real uh he's a very he's going to be an enormous dog sweet what's his name his name is zoltar zoltar we named him after the <laughs> We named him after the fortune telling machine in Big. Oh, I know exactly what that is. Because he's going to be big. <laughs> That's fantastic. What a great name for a dog. That's fantastic. <laughs> so you know, it's like we we do take him on. We you know we, we put the masks on and we take him for a walk yeah. around the block. And it's like, come on, Zoltar. Like I feel like we sound. You're like, what the fuck is Zoltar? But um, he's. Uh, he's an otter hound, which is like a, a cousin of the Irish wolfhound. So he's, Oh my God, he is going to be huge. He's already like almost 45 pounds and he's three and a half months. Old. You're going to yeah. have a bus with legs. We're going to have a bus with legs, but um, you know, he's a, he's a real sweetheart. Oh, good. And I didn't, when you said, Oh, my son gives a structure. Cause we have to get up. I had to stop myself from saying like, well, I understand because we have a puppy. I'm like, don't equate a puppy with a no, child. It's true. No, they're children in dog suits. <laughs> children in dog suits it, and it's true it's true you've got to feed them and you're constantly looking at them and are they okay and uh, and you got to teach them to do everything and absolutely it's the same thing yeah and we've already started to identify that we know that in general he'll be a pretty lazy dog but uh-huh. uh after he eats there's usually a period of about an hour where he's uncontrollable Oh, and yeah. we just have to keep distracting him, just like yeah. put it, give him a bone or a chew toy or give him this yeah. or take him on a walk. And then all of a sudden he's out. So we're like, oh, okay, it's 9 p.m. He's out for the night. So sweet. I know. Good. I know. Oh, I hear, I hear a voice. Oh. Here she comes. Lydia Hurst, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Lydia. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Laura, Lydia, Lydia, Laura. When your husband was talking about you with such glowing terms. I was like, well, go get her. Oh, no. Somebody <laughs> didn't mind being trapped indoors with me for an unforeseeable amount of time. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't bodies, it anyway, like, this is not a tremendous shift in our schedule. No. Like, it's like, it's sort of like you said, like, um, it's just the idea of not being able to leave. That's right. right. That's right. In general. Yeah. I know, like, I, I just want to go to the post office and get my mail. <laughs> I know. You can't. You can't do no, it. No. Not right now. No. Not for the next not for the next two weeks. Don't go anywhere. Right. How's the puppy? Uh I think he's good. Good. I mean I'm sure he wants to go on a walk, but I don't want to take him anywhere. No, it's not. He's in a, they're aquatic dogs, and so he's very fine with being wet. So I he'll just it. Oh great. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Go yeah. go get your galoshes on and go go take a walk in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Laura. I hope you have a a wonderful rest of the day and stay safe and healthy. And thank hope, you. It was really a good. pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you so much. You. Nice meeting yeah. you both. Bye. Bye. ID Tanti scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito. Mm.